Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Sorry we've been a bit delayed. We didn't get an FA Cup um, review in because I have been a little crook since the night of the FA Cup. I have not got COVID. I have just got the flu. But just like another season, Manchester United 2022-23 season has come to an end. A lot of emotions through the season. But one thing's for sure, Dino, it's never boring being a Manchester United supporter. How are you, buddy, and how's things going? I think I'm doing better than you, buddy. Looking a bit <laughs> old and, you know, sounding a bit old there, mate. But, you know, yeah, we mate. all had a great time at the FA Cup. You know, obviously you in Sydney and me in Brisbane both saw videos of each other's support stubs and it was a hell of a night. And as you say, like, it's never dull being a Manchester United fan and everyone hates us, so it's um, brilliant. Love it. <laughs> Yeah, mate. Yeah, mate. Well, we're gonna do we're gonna do a season review, and we'll get get into the FA Cup a little bit later into the pod. But you know, let's look at it. We we're fortunate enough in twenty twenty two, we were at the preseason tour, and um, mate, we had a ball down in Melbourne, and you know, Eric Ten Hag brought his team down. Everyone was really impressed with what they saw down there. Talk us through it. If you can remember the tour, because it was a while ago now, I think it's nearly a year since since we've been on it. And um, I know for myself, it was an unbelievable experience. And um, we have been on a few together now. So give us your run through and what you thought of the team um, before the season started. Yeah, well, funny you saying that. I just got a memory pop up on Facebook that I ordered my BMUF puffer jacket. So, yeah, it's not too um, nearly a year. but um. You know, I was excited about this preseason tour. Obviously, Ten Hag brought a lot of young players out with him. And, you know, I was excited to see what Ten Hag was going to do with the team and how he was going to set up. Um, obviously, he didn't bring everyone in before they came to the tour. Obviously, there was players missing. Um, we are fortunate enough to meet a select number of players. And I think they all either went out on loan or left the club or just didn't play. So, it was us that um, cursed them. But, um yeah, I um I was impressed with the preseason tour in itself, like the way we played and um what players got opportunities and stuff like that. Seeing young Zidane playing and you know Hannibal, um yeah, it was really good to see. And it's always exciting for Australian fans when they come out to visit us. Um, I know it's only preseason, but you know I spent two weeks in Melbourne every day just doing something with United, and um yeah, I wish they can come out more often in the future. Well, we did hear through the season and we knew down, down there there was one player that wasn't getting many minutes. And funny funny enough, well, I went back and I looked at our podcast um, just after the tour and you were on it with Emad and myself. And um, we actually thought it was Wambasaka that um, was getting... Um, well, he never played many minutes on the tour, so we thought it was him that was the one getting in trouble on tour. And um, through the season, we found out it was actually Garnacho that got himself into trouble. So... So that put that one to bed. But you know what? For me on that tour, you know, it was, again, like you said, the youth players are awesome to watch. And, and um, yeah, I don't want to skip over the, the preseason tour because it, it, it is always exciting for us um, United fans down under, isn't it? And, um, yeah, look, you know, it's not often the games that are the most exciting. It's actually the pregame that we always have a have a good time and, and I, I still remember on that pre pre game when we were all going down to, um, I think it was at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, and um, we stopped the traffic all the way. We had a sea of reds um, travelling down whatever the main street is there, and for about a kilometre we stopped the traffic. And I was in the middle of the middle of the uh, road, uh, singing a few songs, stopping traffic, getting beeped at, and everything like that. But you know what? Everyone knew who Manchester United was on that tour. That's for sure. Look, going into the Premier League, you know, we, we had an upturn of 17 points from last season. Um, United were the second uh, most improved team in the Premier League. Um, you know, probably not many people would have picked Manchester United to finish the top four after, you know, after the defeat to Brentford 4-0. You know, it was probably our uh, worst defeat before, besides losing to Liverpool. I won't say the school, <laughs> which was horrific. But, you know, um, 
give us your thoughts on the Premier League for us this year and um uh give us give us a favorite moment that you had. Yeah, well obviously the first two games didn't really go to plan and you know, we're obviously missing that midfield general and you know, obviously Casemiro came in after those two games and really steadied the ship in midfield and we looked at a complete different team. Um obviously Martinez joining and stuff like that. It would take time to gel and you know, I think it didn't take him too long to gel, to be fair. Like, obviously, the first two were disappointing. But after that, we were quite good. And, you know, we didn't lose at Old Trafford this year, I don't think. Oh, just the one game at the start of the year, sorry. And then, yeah, it was just, um, yeah, I was impressed, to be fair. Like, there's not many times where a new manager comes in and you say, oh, that player's improved under him. That player's, you know, really doing better under him, stuff like that. Our last few managers, we've never really seen improvement in our players that we already have. They usually look just to bring in players and stuff like that. So, you know, you look at like, you know, Luke Shaw this year, you know, he's been amazing. He was my player of the season, to be fair, because I think he just stepped up wherever he needed, centre half, left back, whatever the team needed, he was there. And he he showed a lot of leadership this year. Like, you see him like... um you know, when there an instance in the game, like he'd be up to the referee and stuff like that. Usually what you see captains and that do. So he's shown a real quality this year in his leadership and hopefully that continues. Players like Juan Basaka improve immensely throughout the season. Considering he didn't play, I think, probably the first 10, 11 matches, Dallow pretty much had that spot, you know, and then he, I think he did a quad or a hammy. Um, and then that sort of gave Juan Basaka, you know, his, his chance and he took it with both hands. Yeah, look, one thing I enjoyed with Eric Ten Hag this <clears throat> this season is um, he trusted players. He, he really did. And, yeah, I think the first time we saw uh, Luke Shaw move into that centre-half role, I think everyone was a little concerned. Um, but he, he most certainly stood out in that centre-half role, didn't he? And, um, yeah, and to Malaysia's credit, he came in and he, he'd done a good job on that left-hand side, even though a couple of times there um, he was a little bit loose. But I think... You know, one thing I was proud of this year is is our is our um, rookie players. Um, and if anyone collects cards, Malaysia was one of our rookie players, and so was Garnacho. Um, they were probably the two big ones for us um, this season. And I was I was really proud of those blowers. Garnacho got his first goal um, for United in the Europa League, which was fairly exciting. He's He's the excitement machine for most Manchester United fans now. And um, it's good to have those youth players stand out. I would have liked to have seen Palestri probably get a lot, little bit more time, which, which is good. But um, I suppose Eric Ten Hag had to justify Anthony's, Anthony's figure. Uh, so, you know, probably on a downside this season, which I think a lot of people are forgetting, you know, unless Eric Ten Hag made that decision to get rid of Ronaldo, I think we could have been up shit creek a little bit. So, and as I was saying, I went back and looked at our podcasts earlier in the year and, you know, a lot of us were saying we always, we play better with Ronaldo, without Ronaldo. And that dead set proved a massive point. It did um, come to fruition that that was the case. Uh, we became a bit more of a unit as a team and um, it was, it was exciting to see. So uh, I was really happy with the way we played this year. Yeah, as you say, like, you know, with the whole Ronaldo saga and stuff like that, Ten Hag did a great job with all that. And that's what really impressed me this year was Ten Hag's, like, dealing with the media and the players. Like, I love his press conferences, you know. It's exciting and he plays with the media and stuff like that. And, you know, I really enjoy that side of him. Um, obviously, it's his first year in the Premier League, so he would have learned so much this year. And, um, you know, with Steve McLaren, they're helping him. Like, I can only see us being better for it for next year or for next season, you know. And then, um, you know, you got players in midfield like Casemiro, Ericsson. You know, they had cracking first half of the year, half of the season. And then, you know, they picked up some injuries and obviously Casemiro got shown red card a few times and they sort of dropped off a bit. But collectively, I think, you know, every United fan would be happy with this season. Like, I know on the weekend it didn't go our way, but... If you said at the start of the year that we'd be third and, you know, one trophy, I think we would have all taken that. Um, the only downside is with that Cabrera Cup win is that we didn't see many young players get their opportunity. 
But I think you've got to accept that if he's going to go for it. So, you know, obviously, Ten Hag picks, picks the best players for that game each week and he goes for it. And we didn't see much squad rotation this year. And, you know, that could be proven a point to the owners that, you know, there is no squad death, stuff like that. Who knows what, what the idea of that was. But you saw players like Bruno and that at the end of the season sort of not performing as what they should be. Um, you know, especially Bruno, he didn't miss miss hardly any matches. I don't even think De Gea missed one game. I think he played every game. I don't remember Tom Heaton or anyone getting the game. So um, it just shows you, like, you know, our neighbours, they can just change their team week in, week out, where we couldn't really do that. Um, yeah, definitely. That was a, and, that was a and, big, big... Sorry. Go, Dean. No, you're right. You go. <coughs> I was going to say, that was a massive problem for us this, this season is our depth. Our depth probably killed us away from home as well. Um, you know, I know yourself when you when you were over over in England, you went to a few away games, and um, you know, I think what what the results you had was a draw, and you went to the Carabao yes. Cup semi final, um, the FA Cup semi final. We won that. Stuff, won that. We won that. Yeah, in the penalty shootout, yeah. but yeah, we did struggle away from home, and. Um, so look, continuing with the Premier League theme at the moment, we do need to um, change this squad um, a fair bit. Um, we need to, we need really someone pushing um, De Gea. And um, look, I don't want to talk about De Gea just yet because I've got a bit to say about that. Um, but we also need someone in there to, um, you know, push Bruno a bit, and because Bruno does need a rest and. Um, at t- he can't just play every game. I don't care whether he wants to play every game. The the speed of the game is so much quicker these days, and and we need to find a way to give him a rest. Um, and we definitely need to find that nine. We need to find that nine, and you know, um, you know, we've had a few days since the FA Cup final to read what's going on. It's probably I'm glad we've actually had a few days and not done a pod because. There's been a lot in the media and everything like that. And it's it's funny, we haven't been linked to other strikers just yet. And um, I would have thought, being that the season's finished now for United, we would have been linked to a fair few more other than Harry Kane. Um, yeah, I'd, li- I'd li- definitely like to see a nine in. What about yourself? Yeah, well, there's that young kid from Denmark, Ramos Boyland, or however you say his name. I'll get it one day, but, you know, he's only 20, so he's obviously not our number one target in that position. But to be fair, I think we need two strikers and a, another midfielder. Um, other than that, like, obviously pushing someone for the hair, but, you know, I think under Ten Hag, he, he knows that, he, you know, money's not just there, so he has to get rid of a few players. And th- I think this is the first season where we, in a long time where we're actually looking at selling players for some decent money. Um you know, who knows what's happening with Eric Bailly at Marseille and all that. And you got Alex Tellers at Seville. So there's those players too that, you know, should be sold. And obviously Dean Henderson, hopefully get a bit for him. And, you know, there's obviously talk about Scott McTominay, Harry Maguire, Anthony Langer. There's also talk of Hannibal going to Dortmund. So, you know, there's talks like that. I just hate to see them just sold. Like, especially Ilanga and um, Hannibal, like, Happy for him to go out on loan, even if it's a two-year loan deal. I just don't want to see him sold because, you know, they look promising. And I think Elanga was brought into the squad too early. And that was no fault of his own. It was just that we had no one else at the time. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, Hannibal, I think, is a player for the future for sure. I love that guy. So, um, yeah, give, give him to Dortmund for two years on loan and um, see what happens. But um, it's exciting times, you know. Obviously, transfer window throws up a lot of shit talk. You know, the ownership's dragging on like we knew it would. So we need some answers on the ownership, I think, before we start spending big on in transfer window. Yeah, look, look I, was, I was just reading just then. It was actually an, a 27th home game of the season, a record equaling um, record at home. So, you know, it's something to be proud of. Um, and it, it's funny enough, you know, two seasons ago with Ollie, we broke a record with away games. So, you know, the potential's there to get on a good run. We just got to, we just need that, that backing, don't we, as a club, um, to actually see us compete with City. 
as much as it hurts us, you know, to to Arsenal's credit, as much as they didn't win a trophy this year, 95% of the season, they were competing with, with City. And, um, you know, I, I wish that was us, to be honest with you. Well, to be fair, like, Arteta brought in a main striker and Gabriel Jesus, like, you know, we, we didn't bring in a striker at all. Like, we got a loan deal for Weghorst, who was playing in the Turkish lead, and he's from Burnley, who are in the second division. So, you know, that FA Cup final, we went into it with Weghorst. City went into it with Haaland and Alvarez. Like, and we're still yeah. up there, you know what I mean? Like, so we get that quality striker in, a, you know, a couple players. Like, we're not far off, you know. You know, it's just those key positions, like, Rashford for me will never be my number nine. I just I don't see him as a number nine. He's out on the left. He looks happy there, and uh, yeah. So we need two number nines to come in. Yeah, it's a t- it's a tough one that one, isn't it? Because you know we've got a young kid in Garnacho. Um, we've got Sancho as well, which we all know Sancho probably does better off the right. Um, but he's he's had a real, you know that that's probably um for Sancho. You know, he went through a bit of di- a real difficult stage earlier in the season. Then he came back in. He was on fire for about two or three games, and then, and then he went up like that, and then he went down again. So, you know, that, that that's another one we have to make a call on. But I mean, you could play Anthony and Sancho on one side. You could play Rashford Garnacho on the other. Um, you know, so those four are pushing each other. Um, so we need that nine. So if that nine comes in, we may need two nines so they can push each other. Um, so, you know, that, well, that's There should always... be two for every position to be pushing each other. That's like, right. That's right. You look at other squads. Like, I know Chelsea were horrible this year, but they spent a lot of money on and they've probably got three players in each position. It's just they got a lot of injuries and stuff like that and a bit of turmoil at the club. But, you know, they spent a lot of money. And once again, they didn't really have that main striker. And to be fair, there's not many number nines out there in the world that, um, you know, have that quality. Yeah, definitely. Look, it used to, look my, my most improved player this year was, I, I've had a big think about this and um, I've, I've been laying in bed, so I've had a chance to think about it this year. And um, uh, so for me, my, my most improved player this year would have to be um, Aaron Wambasaka. I really enjoyed seeing him... Um, get down that right-hand side as much as at times he, he, he looked like um, he wasn't confident doing it, but by the, by the end of the season, it was great to see his defensive role, which we know he is very good at um, turn a lot of it into attack. Uh, Would have been great to see him get a couple of goals, but again, he's another one of those players that really, really suffer in front of goals. Uh, But, you know, he, he gave defenses, something to think about. And I thought he actually worked well with Anthony um, at times. Whereas for me, you know, if I'm going probably um, the player that didn't improve the most, which, I mean, I know we had Anthony come in, um, but with the price tag he's got, he was probably the most disappointing for me. Even even though he did score a couple of goals, um, at crucial times, and I know I did speak about Sancho, but I think Anthony played a lot more of the season than Sancho. Um, I, I I was just get I would love to see Anthony in this off season learn to do something a bit more than cut in all the time, and um, looking for that shot for the far post and cutting in and driving into that box and trying to whip it far post. Uh, I think he needs to bring a lot more to his game for next season. Um, so that's my two plays that I think one, you know, most improve and the other, the most disappointing for me. What about yourself? Yeah, well, I didn't have as much time as you to think about this. And <laughs> the top of my head, I, I couldn't decide between Phil Jones and Anthony Martial, but I'd probably <laughs> go Phil Jones over him at the moment. But uh, <laughs> to be fair, like, for me, it's Luke Shaw. Um, obviously, we know he's a quality player, and but you know he's he's dropped off the last couple of seasons, and just this year he just went to another level, and not just in his playing, but his leadership role and stuff like that. I, I was really impressed with him, and hopefully he can continue that. And you know we've got some young kids pushing him there too. You got Malasia and Fernandez too that was on loan this season, so you know I just hope he keeps pushing. 
um, forward and he has a good off-season, injury-free, and comes back firing. Um, I'm probably with you on the um, disappointment with Anthony. Obviously, it's a price tag that we all look at. And um, I don't know if he's ever played as a number 10, but, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing him have a got number 10, to be fair. Like, he can he controls the ball well and stuff like that. And, you know, just free him up a little bit so he's not, like, always man-marked out there with wide. Um, you know, we... He can beat the defender. We all know that. He's got a trick in him. Obviously, he's got to prove himself before he can start showboating and stuff like that. But, yeah, for me, he was my uh, biggest dis- disappointment this season. Yeah, well, I mean, look, if if people are going to judge Harry Maguire and his price tag, you're definitely got to judge Anthony. Um, you know, I know he's only young. I think he's only 22. So, mm. um, so there is there is a lot of potential with Anthony and... And by no means am I am I bagging him or anything like that. That's for sure. He can only get better, surely. Like, that, that's know, right. In that's the right. League, it's tough, tough for anyone, you know. Like, um, you know, he's he's not the first player to struggle in his first season in the Premier League. So that's right. Look, another player I'm going to put out there is 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 Rashford as well. Like from last year to this year, thirty goals. Um, it's an unbelievable turnaround. And and he's absolutely spot on. When you get your mindset right, you can do anything you want. And um, he he's really proven that this year, which is which is fantastic to see. But he's put himself under a bit of pressure because now everyone's going to be expecting it next year. And um, you know, if he keeps his mind clear and and focus on football, uh, definitely um, he he will be around, uh, scoring thirty plus goals again. Um, for me, Garnacho, he was he was the excitement machine for me this year. Uh, everyone got excited when when he touched the ball. The kid plays with no fear, and um, you know, congratulations to the kid. The kid's eighteen. He's come up from the youth side, and mate, he he is an excitement machine. He got he's got a contract now to twenty twenty eight, so um, he's definitely the player to look out for. So that probably wraps up us for the Premier League. Let's move into the into the Carabao Cup for us. Um, look, it, it it is exciting for us. You know, we went six years without a trophy, um, and this year we won two. We won the Bangkok Cup against Liverpool, and um, we won the Carabao Cup as well. So I'll take the double. So you know, we've we've had teams take a treble. Uh, without not being the correct one. So we'll take the double. <laughs> Did they but get yeah, a trophy look, for the Australian tour or what? Yeah, maybe. Maybe we could have made one up. Well, we maybe, were with the whole side of the stage. <laughs> look, they did have they did have a good run through the um the Carabao Cup. I don't think they met a top six side in the in the whole time they were in the Carabao Cup. Um they also, I think they played nearly every game at home. And um, so, you know, you could say it was an easy pathway, but, you know, they had to turn up and beat what was in front of them as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, no match is easy, let's be honest. It, we're, you know, under Fergie, we struggled to get some non-Premier League sides, you know. So at the end of the day, they did what they did. And I also thought it brought a lot of confidence to the team, you know, that winning mentality doesn't matter what it is, you know, you win the community shield, you're still excited by as a player um, going into the new season. So I think um, that run really helped us and brought the team together. And it shows, man, like the team looks really united. Um, obviously, you mentioned Ronaldo earlier. I think as soon as he left, the whole squad just came together and you saw some new leaders in that dressing room. And um, yeah, it's exciting times. And hopefully we can back, back it up next season and, you know, win it again. And but hopefully get a few more youngsters in that in that team. Yeah. Look, again, look, for me, being that we were playing probably um you know, a lot of teams that were outside the outside the uh, the, the Premier League. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen some youth players get a chance, but you know, Eric Ten Hag, he, he wants to go full ball and he wants to win uh every trophy possible with his best team and you know, so uh, congratulations to United on winning the Carabao Cup. It was certainly exciting for all of us. And, um, you know, I don't want to brush over the Carabao Cup, but, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how 
we again perform in this in this cup next year. And I'm pretty sure Eric will go full ball at it again. I have no doubt about it. Um, he's got he's got a lot to build on, and um, you know it it's great to have another trophy in the cabinet. Yeah. So what do you call it? Um, let's move on to the FA Cup because there's a little bit little bit talk to talk about that. We haven't um we haven't been able to touch on it just yet, but um look. We had our own destiny in our hands to try and stop City um, winning the treble, and they actually haven't done it yet. So this weekend's the European Cup final or the Champions League final. That just shows how old I am. <laughs> and and um, so we're hoping Inter can uh, knock off uh, City this weekend. But, you know, look, 13 seconds in, I've never seen a crowd... You know, we had a lot of people at our event and we're all singing before the before the game and um, everyone was pumped up for this and then it went from 100% to dead set zero, 30 seconds into the game, 13 seconds into the game. It was actually an incredible moment. I've never experienced anything like that before. It was unbelievable uh, to uh, experience that, that's for sure. It was crazy, wasn't it? You know, like that was the same at our pub. Like, obviously, he had the songs and that going and watching the game. I don't think half the people even saw the goal because they just, you know, were drinking, carrying on still. And it was just dead silence. Like, I've never heard a pub like just go dead silent. Yeah. And I was like, is this going to be a 6 0? Like, that, that's what came to my head first. You know, when oh, that yeah. went in, I'm like, is, is this going to be a thrashing? And um, credit to United, it wasn't. Um, I thought both teams were horrible, to be honest. Like, I don't remember either team pampering the goal or anything like that. You know, obviously City scored one brilliant goal and the other one was a bit of a lucky shin shin goal. But, you know, um, yeah, I thought both teams were horrible and it wasn't an exciting final. I can't remember a time when United actually played in a final and it was a nice, easy, smooth game. Like, look <laughs> at all our finals. Uh, extra time, penalty shootout, score in the last minute, you know, even against Crystal Palace in the FA Cup, it was nerve-wracking um, a few yeah. years ago. So we never do things easy. Um, but, yeah, fair play to United. We, we stayed in the fight and we kept on going. And I think it was Garnacho had an effort late on in the second half there. You know, could have just sneaked in, but it didn't. And, um, yeah, as you say, we're all into Milan this weekend, aren't we? We are. Look, for me, for me, I was actually disappointed with the starting lineup. Um, when the starting lineup came came up, so there was a bit of confusion because on um, Manchester United's website, Garnacho wasn't even in the side. So the talk was the talk was was he injured or anything like that? And and then all of a sudden it all updated and everything like that just before kickoff. And and um, I was actually disappointed with the way Eric Ten Hag uh, started the side. To be honest with you, I would have liked to see Garnacho start. I didn't like the fact that um, Rashford was playing up top by himself and then. Sancho and Bruno. We actually spoke about Bruno um, playing out on the right-hand side. Um, that was one thing we didn't want to see uh, because we felt it never really worked through the year. Bruno gets the shits with it. Um, I actually felt um, as the game went on, City were actually... I, I believe City never got out of second gear. I thought we were defending, um, not as a unit, we were defending as individuals. I actually thought... Um, I actually thought every time the fullbacks got the ball for City, um, it was really easy for them to play through the the front third. Um, Ericsson didn't know whether to come or go. It just it just felt to me there was so much confusion between I don't know the probably the front five or six players, and then the the ball would just go through to Gundawan or Silva or something like that, and then it just left our backs exposed. It left Casemiro by himself. And then our, our fullbacks had to find a way to defend it. Um, look, I know uh, Lindelof had probably Haaland under control and stuff like that. And and um, Fred gave away a couple of poor free kicks. And But I just thought at times we weren't defending as a unit. And then when we went forward, we I thought, I'm not going to say gutless. I, I'm, I'm going to say we forgot to attack through the game. And it was only until Garnacho came on that we actually had someone 
that was fearless and wanted to actually have a go. And look, I'm sure Eric Ten Hag told Gun at you, go and play your normal game, go and be fearless. Uh, we've got nothing to lose here. But I, I wish we took that bit of sometimes your best form of defense is attack. And um, I'm, a, I'm a real believer in that. And um, I, ju I just thought we failed in that way. Um, yeah, I just really thought we failed. Well, we so, spoke on the podcast last last time we spoke and about how realistically the only time we're going to score against City was, um, you know, long ball over the top, you know, or a counter attack. So, you know, I think we mentioned that Fred would start and he would hold that midfield up with De Bruyne and stuff like that. So, yeah, hundred percent. Like, um, we didn't even look like scoring. I don't think. Like, no. to be fair, I haven't rewatched the match, and um, obviously I was at a pub and it was quite a big night, so. I can't remember everything, but um, I don't remember ever even having City like in the eighteen yard box making them look stressed or anything like that. So um, no, it was it even... is disappointing. But I think I think also like realistically, we have to look where we're at and look where they're at. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I t look, I totally day, agree so. with you that that look as you were saying before, like the the difference in subs and stuff like that. But you know, even even at goal kicks, I thought. You know, there was just some kind of confusion between De Gea and Lindelof. Like, I don't understand why Lindelof's passing to De Gea and how many balls were going. De Gea was clearing a lot of balls straight down the middle of the pitch and and things like that. And it's just like, to me, it was just, there was a lot of panic through our defence. Um, and look, well, look I, at the I first know... goal. Like, oh, anyway, was a... defenders just stood there and watched the ball bounce. And yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, and I think that just made everyone nervous after that. So I yeah, think that look, it, it was, was a poor header by ball, Lindelof so. and and things like that. But it was also an unbelievable finish by Gundogan. But look, I'm not going to sit here and and blame De Gea. And I I actually, it was to to be honest with you, it was it was fucking disgusting. Listen, looking at our supporters, absolutely ripping shreds off De Gea. Um, you know, and it's some of the. You know, I, I do watch a few YouTube channels and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, boys, you sometimes you just got to pull your head in um, after the match and not take it out on one player. And look, we all know De Gea is going to have to move on. He's probably been there too long and everything like that. But as he's getting older, there's a lot more pressure on him. And the second goal, yes, he probably should have saved. He did get a hand on it. Um, but he should have got a stronger hand on it. But if you have a look at the at a cup at the game at that replay, you have a look at the way our defense was lined up. It was like an arc shape in the box. It was like it was horrific. Gundawan on the end of the box again. It, you know, okay, he probably reacted a bit late, but then you don't know what he can see and what he can't see. Um, if if there was a part of the game where I thought it was for him was poor. It was when Gundogan got um, got the third goal, but he was called offside. I actually he made a foot save, and and I actually thought he should have gone down and saved it with his hands. Um, but you know, as far as our fans go, I, I'm just over people just putting shit on him. It's I I understand he needs to go, but I don't believe you can blame him for that whole loss. There's no way in the world you can blame De Gea for that whole loss. Um, you know, yeah, the well, guys... You know me, I don't watch I don't watch any of that YouTube stuff. Yeah. You know, I might do a podcast with you, but, you know, I don't even rewatch these. It's just, I don't... Yeah. You know, this is a conversation between me and you, mates. If people want to listen, that's fine. But these YouTubers yeah, that it. have, like, millions of followers or whatever, their opinion's going out worldwide, you know? And yeah. Like, De Gea, to me, De Gea, the first goal was a brilliant goal. No, no keeper would have saved that. The second goal, I also thought he got caught behind two defenders, so he didn't react until the ball went through the defenders. So, you know, no one's here blaming the defence or anything like that. They always just blame the goalkeeper. And it's like a striker as well, you know, like miss, miss opportunities. It's always the striker's fault. It's always the keeper's fault. It's just those key positions are so easy to blame, you know. And it's always our superstar players that get the most blame as well, you know. Like, you know, who can say anything bad, like, about De Gea as a United career in whole, you know. He... um. Fergie brought him in as a youngster. He was like this skinny, you know, it took him a few years to, you know, build up and get used to the Premier League. And, you know, he's had a stellar career at United. So for people to start bagging him now, I think 
you know, what, what, like, why? It doesn't achieve anything. Um, we all know what's happening, but, you know, I wouldn't sit here and bag a let. He's a club legend in my eyes, and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and bag him out. So he's also kept us in a lot of matches this year with some unbelievable saves. He's kept us in the top half of the table the last probably eight years. So, you know, people are quick to forget these things. And, you know, obviously it's easier just to blame someone. But to me, the whole team was just poor. And at the end of the day, you just got to admit the City were a better side on the night. And, you know, they've got a better squad and a better setup at the moment. Like from the academy to the top, they're better than us. And until we start admitting that, things aren't going to change. And obviously the change is the ownership. Who knows what's happening with that? It's a circus again, like always. Like it always has been at United since they've been there. So until we get that, we're not going to win these FA Cup finals or Premier League titles, you know. It it all starts at the top and me and you know how messy just the administration side of United is, you know. You can't even talk to people and, you know, ticketing, you know, United Direct, whatever you want to do. You can't talk to them. It, it's impossible. And, you know, I know so many people have had issues with, stuff in the club, let alone the football side of things. So until things get cleared up, it's it's not going to change. And, um, you know, I just hope the Glazers piss off and sell the club. And it's actually looking more like Jim Radcliffe's going to get it, to be fair. But I, ho- I hope it's the um, Qatari lot because we need their money to compete with City, let's be honest. Yeah, definitely. Well, look, <clears throat> the Qataris have come in today um, and given their final bid of $6.5 billion for 100% of the club, um, a one billion. I'll, I'll read it off. It's six point five billion for one hundred percent of the club. One billion investment into Old Trafford and Carrington. Eight hundred million for all the um, uh, Manchester United Football Club depths, including in transfers, and one point five billion in transfers and staff recruitment. If the Glazers actually care for Manchester United to move forward. This decision needs to be made in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, otherwise, we're just going to stay in the same position as we are. And um, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs at the moment. And like you said, for us to... Um, I've got my daughter coming in with my dinner. And I've told her before I don't need it just yet. Look at this. What a good girl. What, what'd she cook me? <laughs> She's cooked me some snags, um, some... I can't believe I'm doing this. Hey, Some did corn she have a veggies. Towel on her head? Did she have a towel on her head? <laughs> yeah, she had a towel on her head. Yeah, she's, um, than, do you know uh, what she does? Good. You know what she does? She tries to impress the boyfriend. That's what she does yeah. uh, with cooking. She's never cooked in her life until she met George. So, <laughs> <laughs> so good on her for having a go. So, you know what? Okay, so this is part two of the pod. This one's this pod's going longer than we usually make it, but it's the end of season. So, Dino, you were talking about the ownership and um, let's continue with that before we're rudely interrupted by my daughter with my dinner. Yeah, well, you know, as you mentioned, like, if the Glazies cared, they would sell it. And, you know, simple answer there is they don't care. I don't know if they're holding out for more money or what it is, but I don't see anyone stumping up more money than what the Qatari group is doing. So that would be stupid not to take it. Uh, you know, wipes all the debt, all that sort of stuff, and they can just move on. They can go buy Liverpool if they want. So it's just, you know, it just drags on, and it's typical United. Everything just drags on. You know, it will be linked with Mason Mount, this whole transfer window you watch. Like, it just, whenever there's a story, it just drags on. And I don't know if the club like it like that because they're always in the media or that's just how it is. But, you know, us as fans, it's just like, come on, man, let's... Just hurry up, piss off. Yeah, let's get the job done. Look, I know know it's TikTok and everything like that. And um, look, I'm on that a fair bit because we do really well with this podcast on TikTok. And um, But there is this one guy on on TikTok that, it's funny enough, everything he says about this sale is coming true. And, um, you know, and I do go back and listen to some of the things that he does say. And just to, just to confirm that, what he has said has come true. And, you know, he's he's actually made a claim that the Qatarians have already made the deal and um, and it's been made a while ago, but they're for some reason they're just, you know, he actually said this week will be the deadline. So, um, 
it'll be very interesting to see whether the deal is actually done. Um, not many things he said um, hasn't come through issue through this. I've used that word twice now through this pod. Um, Too big a words for us. Man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know. Oh, it's shocking. Yeah, it's not many um, things that he has said hasn't come true in this process of sale. I thought um, you were going to say it again there for a minute. No, no, no. Yeah, through this sale. So it'll be interesting to see if the Qatarians actually have actually um, are the front runners. And because in the media, all they talk about is, is Ratcliffe being the favourite. So, yeah. So sometimes when that happens, it's usually the opposite. So anyway. Let's move on from that. I'm just going to have a day off work once they sell it. That's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've had two or three off this week, so I don't think my boss would be impressed if I, if I take another day off. So <laughs> I won't be having a day off. But you know what? All things considered, um, this was a good season for the club. Um, Eric Ten Hag delivered on uh, club expectations for a top four finish where um, the trophy drought, you know, ended. Um we had some breakthrough superstars come through. Um, you know, we're heading in the right direction. We're in the Champions League as well. So overall, I think it's I think it was a great season for us. And um, you know, I want to move into our favorite segment. What's, What's new that, in the cave? Here we go. What's new in the cave? What do we got, Dino? Who's going first this week? I know you've had a couple of good hits. Wrong. Yeah, Paper let's go. Wrong. It's only two times. Okay, go two, three. (laughs) That's too much confusion. I'll go first. You go first. And you have had a massive hit this week, but I'm not sure what you're going to bring up to us. No, I'm saving that beauty, mate. mate, You know, the talk of the treble on the noisy side of town has got me wanting to show you this. When we actually won the treble and all three finals in the same week, not you know months apart and stuff like that. So, you know that's signed by Fergie as well. Yeah, I love that. There, it's a beautiful piece. It's from the former Players Association. Um, it's beautiful, and obviously in it you can see Schmeichel with his kids at the front there, and you know Dean's Gate was rammed that day. You've probably seen iconic photos of people hanging off the scaffold and all that sort of stuff, and yeah, it's just amazing. So let's be the only. Um, side of Manchester to have the treble and um yeah come on Inter <laughs> definitely that is an awesome piece that um I've actually got that one so um I have been hiding it away and I'm trying to get more signatures on it but do you know that's a absolute cracking uh, piece that one so I'm gonna bring on um, the one that I've got I actually got while I was um over in the UK and it, it's probably my favorite piece for the past year even though I have got other ones, but it's definitely my favourite one. It's a um, it's a George Best piece. It's actually done by um, Trevelyan Art. He he does all these um, characters and stuff like that. And if you go onto his um, website, you'll see he does like um, F1. He does all different sportsmen and everything like that. It's actually from the George Best Foundation. Um, this is signed by the 68 68 or not the whole of 68 squad because i think this was done in 2000 and might have been 2006 so it was all the surviving surviving members um of the 68 squad um so you got bobby child and alex stepney patty creran brian kidd bill folks um tony boone nobby styles and um you know players like that so these these were actually supposed to go to go to uh, the actual players. Uh, so that I think, how many is there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've got nine of 15, which was actually Bobby Charlton's number. So this one was actually supposed to go to Bobby Charlton. Uh, but apparently the event got cancelled. Um, on the back here, I've got all the details of the event. And the event actually was um, being organised by, um, by Alex Stepney and David Sadler. So, um, so you know, it's a genuine item. I actually got it from Sean Kelly. So I do know of one more that is here. Shane's got that. And he actually had his frame the other day. And he, 
he had it framed really nice, which I'm considering doing the same thing. I've just put it in this so it doesn't get wrecked. Um, so, mate, another couple of good items. And it is a favourite with our TikTok friends, um, this one. And um, you know what, Dean? It's been an absolute pleasure having you on um, over the Before past... You go. Before you go, you mentioned Sean Hit Kelly. Me, I think we need to get him on, on here. <laughs> spend all day on here with him. Yeah, we'd need a point of Guinness, who Sean Kelly is. You look at Adam's cave there. His is about times 30 of that. And he has unbelievable pieces that you wonder where he got them from. And yeah, stuff does. that you've never seen before. So, yeah, it's you know, incredible. Sean Kelly, he's, he's got a massive collection. So, shout yeah, out well, to Sean. I'm... I saw you a few weeks ago. So, hope you were a lot of you. my stuff that I've got here, actually, when I first started collecting Manchester United stuff, uh, Mark O'Connor got me in touch with Sean Kelly and um, I, I did get a lot of stuff from Sean um, when I first started getting all this together. Um, a lot of the individual photos that I've got up on this wall here. So um, nah, Sean's an absolute top bloke and I, and I was so happy to meet him earlier this year when we went over. And, uh, you know, like, like there's another one, Leslie Millman as well. It's, his collection is absolutely phenomenal. So if anyone wants to um, get hold of these guys and and look, Leslie Millman's on Flickr. He, he's got like he's got thousands and thousands. He had he had he had one room there where um, it was actually probably half this cave, and um, he had twenty five thousand items just sitting in that in that in that area, and that was just one area of probably two or three. Um, as we know, a lot of the houses in the uk and they may be three stories high and they're not too wide so all these guys have got um, small areas but a lot of items in this in the in the small area and um but uh it's it's great to be part of this collecting community and um you know dino you're a big card collector too you've you've obviously got back on the bandwagon since you've come back um which is which is fantastic it's good to have your head around some of these card pages again and and um you know it's it's good to have uh, collections down under. Um, so uh, it's proud. I'm proud to, you know, be mates with you, Emad, and and um, and other pe people around Australia. You know, especially over in Perth, where you got Ian Cosley and stuff like that. And you know, it's good to have mates like that. And we we do share our ideas, and we also look after each other when it when it comes to collecting as well. So it it makes the back pocket a little bit lighter when we're um, helping each other out. So, Dino, it's been a fantastic season. Um, it all started back in Melbourne, and we've ridden the wave. We actually, both of us got over to Old Trafford this year, which was unbelievable. And, you know, I think we're both hoping to get back maybe next year or next season. Um, so, you know, this won't be the last pod before... Um, before the preseason tour, we'll think of other things to come up with. But you know, um, you know me. You, you just look after me when it comes to this pod because I love doing them and I love having a chat about United. So, uh, good on you, mate. And uh, I'll talk to you later. See you later. Check you.